And part of our role is to bring out the genius in their kids, whether that genius fits into what we determine, you know, like what the adults determine, right? Like one of the, one of the struggles I've really had with education is the, the notion that all three of us in the space right now could all say we're successful, but we totally define that on different things, right? How we define what success means to us. But then in education, what we do too often is we def define success for our kids and we tell mm -hmm. them this is what we will look like. So how do you, how do you, how does your organization help, you know, kids bring out that genius, even though it's not necessarily, and I don't know if this is the right terminology, like a traditional track, like and I, when I say traditional, it's like what most people know or experienced in school. Right. And I'm not saying it's like a wrong track, but it's just, it's not what most people experience. So how do you, how do you bring out that, that, that genius in their kids, even if it doesn't necessarily fit into the perception of academics. And I know it's not, I'm not like you don't teach like English class or math classes, but how do you bring that out in, in your students? So if I can, you know, kind of preface it with is again, as we were prepping, and I say, I've explained this to a lot of people in a lot of different settings. We have narrowly defined what it means to be smart mm -hmm. in, in, in at least in our culture. So smart means I'm a good reader. I'm a verbal learner. I can write. I'm good at listening and retaining information. I can take notes again, all verbal skills. If I can do those things well, I can do well in, in the traditional way that we deliver education to students. So most teachers were really good at school because we're verbal learners. Again, we get, you know, I could memorize lots of things. Um, and so we've defined that as how you're smart. But what really got me thinking about this is the number of people that I know in my life who say I was a terrible student and yet they're hugely successful. They run their own businesses. Um, or, or whatever it is they do, they're hugely successful in life, but they'll say, I was a terrible student. And so I've been thinking about this over the years. Maybe the issue isn't that they were terrible students, but we only gave them one way to show that they were smart. So one of the things I love about what we do, and really this is work I was trying to do in my previous K-12 districts, is how do we make the learning environment more focused on how the student learns? So... I'm really good at hands-on learning. And I also learned this when I was working in an elementary school as an assistant principal. We, the, the way we were teaching math with these various units, there was geometry and algebra and all these. And I was watching students who were really struggling with some components of math, but when we got to geometry and they were doing a lot of building, I mean, they were just blowing it out of the water. They just, they just got it because that, they had this great spatial sense, but that didn't necessarily translate in another area. And so I think that what we try to do here is, or what we do here on our, what we call labs, so the career tech side, is students are learning by doing. So we have a pre-nursing program. So many of those students are gonna go on to be nurses or other things in the medical field. They don't read about drawing blood and take a test on drawing blood. Uh -oh. They draw blood. I'm gonna get <laughs> sick. I don't know if this, I don't know if that's the avenue you wanna go down with me. I'm gonna get sick. <laughs> but, but we don't, you know, we don't, we have a culinary program. We don't, our, we teach our students about how to debone a chicken and they might, we show them and demonstrate it, but then they have to do it themselves. And so they have the opportunity to learn by doing, and they have the opportunity to show their learning by doing what we would call performance assessment in that more traditional school um, environment. And so one of the things we're working on and, and, and Shelly's really leading this work, um, I best could lead this work with our team is, how do we take that philosophy of career tech learning and imply, apply that in our academic classrooms? We do teach math. We do teach English. We do teach social studies. We do teach science. There's, we, on our high school side, there's still high school students. They have to take all of those courses. And so really thinking about not what's one way that students can learn and show they're smart, but what are other ways that students can learn and then show their learning? Generally from there and what I found now is it, it's all still the same thing like when you have that conversation mm -hmm. and a lot of times just getting people to really kind of see where where you're coming from but also seeing where they're coming from yeah. you know and oh. and and getting them just to see like hey look we might disagree you know like a parent mm -hmm. could have disagreed with you they might have said no you, you should have suspended that kid 
Yeah. Well, you know, maybe I could have, but this is why I felt this was yeah. the, the the right way. But once again, you were engaging people in a very authentic conversation and being very real with them. Yeah. So it still alleviates that that pressure that I like to say. That pressure comes from when you're not having that clear um, communication. Yeah, and that social capital that you know I built in communities when I was an administrator, I'm sure I know you would do the exact same thing. Every morning, I'm outside greeting families, talking to kids, talking to, you know, um, parent in the hallway sees me and says, hey, can I talk to you for a second? I would never say, hey, you need to book an appointment. I was just like, hey, yeah, no problem. Come on in. If like if, I have, if I'm free. And then when when something goes wrong, then then it was way easier to deal with. Right. But if that was the first time I ever interact with that parent, they don't know anything about me. They don't know if I care about their kid. They don't like that that's then that turn that five minute conversation could you know it could turn into hours and then calls the superintendent and all that other stuff right can i can i chime in on that for a second please please because because when you said that it brought me to something and something that really kind of hit home for me as an administrator so yeah. i i think i made the comment earlier my my first administrative job was at, at middle school Mm -hmm. And it was actually in a different district. So the, di the district that I had started in teaching actually went to a different district yep. to become middle school assistant principal. And, you know, I was 25. I think I had just yep. turned 25, 24, right. 25. So I was super young, you know, really young as, a, as an administrator, yep. right? So get to middle school, obviously start making those relationships, right? So I was there maybe two years. Yeah, I was there two years. Then... I went back to grad school at UGA. So we were gone for several years and then I moved back and I ended up moving back in the district where I had started my administrative career at the time. Right. Mm -hmm. And I happened to then get a job at the high school up the street from the middle school where I used to be an assistant principal. Right. right. And those same little kids were now, half of them were like grown kids because they were, some of them were looking me in the eye and I'm about six, yeah. six, three, six, four, everybody. So some of those kids hit a huge growth spurt in those couple of years I was gone. But what was crazy was how those relationships then carried over right. when I got back. Those same, oh, Mr. Wood, like, they were, uh, oh, you haven't changed. I mean, you look a little older, your hairline. It start what did uh, one mom just say, Mr. Woods is starting to fade a little bit, honey. I'm like, yeah, you know, age is catching up to me. This stress that these kids giving me, but but all all joking aside, it it I remember it was such a surreal feeling because thinking just thinking about how how some nuggets that you put years ago right. and laying the foundation is playing dividends several years later. Cause like I said, they hadn't seen totally. me for what, two, maybe three years and rock come in the door. Oh, Mr. Woods. Hey, what's up? Oh, Mr. Woods up. We know how you feel about this. My bad. I mean, it just felt good just to kind of um, validate the impact of building those relationships. It's like, it's like, uh, if you know anything about stocks, ETFs, things like that, the earlier invest, the more you pays off the longer, it's like compound interest. Like when you said that, basically those years going on over and over and over again, that compound interest, you know, accumulates very, very quickly. What are some of the strategies that you've seen that maybe, you know, have been effective, like, cause nothing's effective for everybody, but what are some of the things that you've been trying to implement to kind of help your staff and students through that? There's a couple of things I would say, like the first of which is just um, like psychoeducation, like just learning about your own psychology, learning about the, the, the way you think, um, you know, like the anxiety piece, the way you were describing it is perfect. It's almost like, um, you know, if you remember learning back in elementary school, like about a concentric circle where it just like mm -hmm. starts in the middle and builds bigger and bigger and bigger, um, and wider, um, that's, you know, that is an anxiety loop that a lot of people feel. Yeah. Um, and you know, what specifically in school with, with teachers and staff, um, you know, I had a really interesting experience. I became the the interim principal in January 2020 of my school uh, of my school year, and uh, or for this school rather, excuse me. And I had that position from January 2020 till July 2020. So right, like when COVID right. hit, it was right. like, oh my god, you know. Right. Um, but what I would tell the teachers is then, and and even now, is like, 
I feel like our greatest flaw is our high expectations because the high expectations are not steady. They're like, they're just ever increasing. And it's like teachers and, and, and educators today feel like they have to be pitch perfect on everything or, you know, you're exploited as, as being incompetent. Mm -hmm. And what I would explain to the staff and I still do is like, we can't be afraid to make mistakes. We just can't be. Um, the hard part about that obviously is the insecurity that comes along with it. And, you know, maybe like the critique and the, and how are people from the outside looking in, but at the same time, it's, you, you can't live in a world where you're not allowed to make mistakes. Right. And, and given the, the new expectations surrounded around education, it's, you know, the mistakes are plentiful. <laughs> yeah. And like, I, and I, I just want to clarify, cause I think it's not that like, we always have high expectations and high expectations aren't a bad thing, but right. it's, ex we're, it's like, we're supposed to have high expectations in way more things. And that's, I think, I think that's kind of the issue. Right. Yeah. And like one of the, one of the things I always talk about, so I don't know when you went to school, but people that, you know, listen to this podcast, some of them went to school in the sixties, some of them went in the seventies, you know, maybe before some of them, maybe in the 2010s. Right. And I've always said this, the, the length, of the school day, no matter what decade you went to school is basically exactly the same, but right. the, the demands go up every single year. And, and it's kind of like, it's like, how can you continuously do this? Do you think of like, cause you inspire so many people, but when you think of your educational background, your career, and you think of like teachers who inspired you, like who is someone who inspired you as a teacher and why? And it could be someone, you know, when you're a kid, it could be someone, you know, a colleague, so who's someone you think of right away? Listen, what I do know for sure, it's education just truly changed the trajectory of my life. And so things were crazy at home. But when I went to school, I had great teachers. And to me, elementary school is so foundational. And so when you uh, think about my the most inspiring teacher, I can say my kindergarten teacher, Ms. Lepley, who, I mean, she was meaner than a junkyard snake, but she was a person <laughs> who told me I was smart. I can talk about my first grade teacher, Ms. Freeman, who was incredible, or my second grade teacher, uh, Ms. Proffer, or my third grade teacher, Ms. Stone. But the one that I, I guess really caused me to look at my life differently and my future opportunities differently was Ms. Kathleen Bradford. You see, I was raised in the country, small school, small town. I'm just a country girl. And in this school, we had um, mostly all white teachers. Mm -hmm. And so Ms. Bradford was African-American and she looked like me. And so I'll never forget, <laughs> she would wear, you know, you know how your elementary teachers wear the, the, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the dresses, they're plaid and, right. and they have the suspenders. And I promise you, I wanted one of those so badly. <laughs> I wanted to be just like her. And the one thing that she did, and again, I know it doesn't go with any, um, may not excite anyone else, but she gave titty rolls. It was yeah. a hundred on your spelling test. And I would study all week because I wanted to score 100 and get a Tootsie Roll. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we did math games. And if you did, went around the world and you beat everyone in the class, then you get your name on the board as the, the fastest student for the whole week. And mm -hmm. so Ms. Bradford was professional. She was encouraging. She was engaging. And she made you just want to do better. And for me, being the first uh, African-American teacher that I ever had, it was just, I think it truly uh, started you know, me thinking about being a teacher in the future. Can, can I ask, have you ever like talked to her since then? Like, <laughs> Listen, you know, what's the strangest thing? Miss Bradford ended up um, still being at the campus when I became a principal. And so, no. <laughs> yes. So she was still a teacher at Cold Spring Intermediate School when I became the principal. And she was- one You were her boss? boss? Is that what you're telling me? I was. I That's was. Amazing. And she was- amazing and she was very um she would stay late she was one of those uh ones who was very wise and mm -hmm. i'll never forget because i had always been secondary and i had to go down to intermediate to be a principal which was grades three four and five and that's hard it's hard trust me right. to go from secondary to elementary and i didn't know like all the fancy terms that you use at elementary schools and i was telling her one day all the things i didn't know and she okay. said, well, we need somebody who is going to make sure we have good discipline and good culture. Yeah. Don't worry about the whole school. We'll worry about the pieces that need to happen in the classroom. So she would wait till everyone had left for the day and she would come visit uh, my office afterwards and just was really encouraging. And so long story short, she knows uh, that I respected her a great deal. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, um, she won't be able to hear this podcast because... Mm -hmm. 
um, right during COVID, uh, she died from a complication. So uh, Ms. Bradford, her reach, she uh, served nearly 40 years in Cold Spring, Texas as a, as a teacher. So her reach was was far and wide. Okay, so I'm going to tell you, like, I, I, I am like, I'm a very emotional person. And when you told me about her guiding you as a principal, that <laughs> almost started making me cry. Like, I'm like, I was like, I was almost yeah. like going out of the cameras because I'm like, I don't want to start that's amazing. It, it, it keeps going though. I actually became right. superintendent in Cold Spring. And really? so we continue to provide guidance then as well. That's amazing. Hey, I, I got to I gotta tell you this. So, you know, I grew up in Canada. So teachers didn't wear that. We wore snowsuits. Like, <laughs> I'm like, we didn't wear any of that stuff in Canada. It's free. <laughs> Uh, Ka is Kathleen Bradford correct? Kathleen Bradford. Kathleen Bradford, just like that's one of my <laughs> one of my things I love is just that idea of like how like legacy lives on in you know students, and that's just absolutely amazing. And so I pulled up actually an old article I wrote. And I'm gonna I'm curious. I'm gonna ask you about these questions I asked. And I'm because here's here's a reason I um and I, I just want to know what you think of them because when you work in educational technology. You're even though, and this is something I always say is that a lot of times you're not trained for this, but a lot of times you spend your time fixing crap. Like, let's be honest. It's not just the learning stuff. It's yeah. you. And like, there's, there's some value to this too. Um, but it isn't what you're supposed to do, right? It is like, you're supposed to focus on learning. Um, and so you are dealing with it departments. And I think a lot of times people in this space, one of the frustrations is their it department right and uh there's a terminology called um fud it's actually called fear and, and actually once i share this to you don't just limit this to, to it this actually happens a lot in the world uh fud is actually stands for fear uncertainty and doubt so for example if you ask your it department like hey we want to try this thing oh that's like a safety issue and a lot of people are like well if it's a safety issue then i'm not doing it and they just like they just live that right but I actually, you know, when I started working, I'd be like, well, tell me how it's a safety issue. And then they were kind of thrown off, right? Like, like you need to, like, I need you to explain this to me because I actually understand this stuff, right? And sometimes, like, I think more and more people have, I wouldn't say an IT background, but are comfortable with technology who understand learning, where I think years ago, we had a bunch of people really good with technology that, you know, did the frameworks and made decisions for teachers and said, here's what you get, right? So, um, in your work with IT departments and kind of going through that and kind of be like, have you ever felt like a, um, almost like a liaison, maybe like maybe it's the wrong term. And by the way, IT department, people have the hardest job. I, they're not, maybe not the hardest job. They have the most ungrateful job. Nobody ever calls the IT department at the end of the day and says, Hey, the internet worked all day. Thanks. Nobody's <laughs> ever done that. Well, right. So they never get kudos that they deserve. You know, they only hear when crap goes wrong. So did you, did you ever feel like you were like a mediator between staff and IT? Always, always. always. Yeah, always. I actually uh, tell a story in the book of how uh, a friend of ours, um, Eric Kwong, uh, yeah. he is the IT um, director, so to speak, at a district I work with, and we will walk classrooms together. And we both learn so much from each other. Uh, mm. I have learned why and how uh, certain, uh, you know, certain tech uh, logistics are possible or not, or what might be a better hardware for something or whatever. And then he learns, oh, this is what the teachers actually need to do. Now I know what to research to make sure it works with our infrastructure, et cetera. Um, right. And it has been an amazing learning experience. Uh, he's not a trained teacher. He's trained in IT. I'm not yep. trained in IT, but I need to know what's possible and when I have administrators from other schools, for example, saying, oh, well, we, my IT person told me we can't do that. Oh, okay, well, let me uh, let me call someone and, and right. uh, right. have the verbiage for you to talk to them because maybe they just don't know or, yeah. or have the FUD. They have the FUD, I should right. say. Right, and the, and the FUD, like when, you, when they do this, they'll say, oh, like I remember saying to IT person, I got to tell you the story. I may be outing a district right now um about this wi-fi and uh one time i was well first a little preamble there's um when when you're saying things like oh that doesn't fit with our infrastructure one of the things i would say to my t department and like the last person i worked with out of my school district was amazing he was like i was like you know hey this doesn't work in our infrastructure so we're gonna have to change our infrastructure because we need to figure out how to make it work <laughs> 
like that's how he was like that wasn't me it was him right wow. i learned a lot that's from great. that process right and i think that's powerful but i think one time um i remember actually going to a school district and i'm curious if you've ever had an experience like this so i'm speaking at the school district and i said hey like uh, i would really want the teachers like sharing you know tweeting so i can see what they're thinking while i'm speaking and they're like oh the, well the teachers don't have access to the wi-fi in the school i'm like what do you mean they don't have access to wi-fi I'm like well we don't give that out to teachers right i'm like what i'm like i'm like maybe you should have researched me before you brought me here right? <laughs> like, i'm not i might be trouble today right so i said well hey i really need it for the day can we just like give teachers the password yeah. and so they have access i need access because of the stuff i'm doing so if you don't have if you don't allow me internet access this is gonna be a really tough day right so they gave it to me reluctantly right the it department and then, uh, so they gave me the password. I said, hey, I'm just gonna throw the password up on the screen so everyone could just see it and they get access to it. And I, I, I know, I think I could tell you know where I was going. They said, no, 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 don't do that. They went to every teacher in the room, grabbed their device and logged on for them because they were like, there's no wow. way we're telling these people the password. And wow. I was like, really i'm like you are you are basically phasing yourself out of a job because people are going to say i'm not using this because it's too much hassle and then if they don't use it then what are you doing if they don't use it then they're like we don't need this technology is that like is that is that like a shocking story that i just shared no I mean, sadly it's no no it's not right yeah so that that to me and like it's i think kind of going back to what you're saying earlier it's like who are you serving right like if you want teachers to use this, and I think a lot of times they, there are so many barriers to things that your high flying teachers that are comfortable with technology, they're willing to jump over the barriers, but the 95% that aren't willing to do that, whereas you got to take away every barrier for them so that it's easy, right? So that you don't have to think about it. So here, here's an article I wrote, and I'm curious. Um, so I asked, I say these four guide, guiding questions for your IT department. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to share each one with you and I just want your thoughts. So you can say if you like the question or not, like, how do you see this? So the first question is, what is best for kids? What do, what do you think of that question in relation to the IT department? They, they really don't always know. They, they, they know like this is meant to be like a back and forth, right? Like this is the conversation we're having, right? Yeah. I have used that. Um, I've, I've used that with IT departments before or I remember one example and it's hard for them to dispute. A lot right. of times they don't know what's, what's best for yeah. kids. Like you said, Adam. And then when I have said things like, I just would hate for our kids to not have X because this is, mm -hmm. they need Y. Uh, it's difficult for them to dispute that. And so it's a great way to kind of center the conversation on what really matters. That's, that's exactly why I asked the question. I love that you said that. And so the reason, the reason why is because I didn't want to go with, I didn't want to start with what fits in our infrastructure. Right. So if we, if we can figure out, Hey, and it's, these are meant to be not like putting it departments on the spot. These are meant to be questions for a conversation. Right. So if we say, this is what we need for kids. And then we decide, hey, this is what's really going to help our students. Then we have to like figure out what fits in the infrastructure. So mm -hmm. that's why I asked that question. Okay. So the second thing is, the second question I ask is, how does this, whatever this thing is you're doing, improve learning? So any thoughts on that question? So, so like if, if you're implementing something, how, how does it improve learning? So if I... I'm thinking of when they restrict things. So, oh, we can't have Gmail accounts for our students and we can't have G, uh, Google Calendar on. Well, how mm -hmm. does that benefit their learning? And then they're going to talk about safety, mm -hmm. but I can ask you about how does that affect their learning? So it's kind of interesting that it's focused on learning and not because to be honest, to be safe, we have to teach kids to be safe. Right. So if it's focused on learning, then shouldn't we give them some tools with some safety features? I mean, that's fine, cool. but maybe yeah. we should teach the kid to live in a digital world instead of throwing them out there when they're 18 and out of our system. I think that this speaks to the power of having an ed tech coach because I, I, I'm, I'm hearing these stories and these questions here and I, I feel spoiled because I, my IT department that I work with is not like that at all. Right, right. That's I, awesome. I work with them so, so long. I have such a good relationship with our head of IT. We play fantasy football together. 
we we're he's a Giants fan. I'm a Dodgers fan, so we're always going back and forth. But I, I I can text him at any time with anything that's you know student related. And he he knows that a lot of teachers forget they they go right to him for for pedagogy based stuff. He he just forwards me the emails and anything that's an ID request, I forward it back to him. And we have a great relationship, and he trusts me that I'm going to make the right decisions. You know, we're both you know super admin in our in our Google domains and gives me pretty much carte blanche to to push out apps and Chrome extensions and stuff like that um, that I see fit. And um, mm. we had that great relationship. So I, I, I can't really speak to I think some of the year, um, some of these that situations. Yeah. That's yeah. Well, so there's, there's actually, so actually that question, that second question is more of an educational technology focus or a teacher focus. And here's what I mean by that. So a teacher goes to some event, okay? They're like, oh my God, I saw this tech. It is incredible. I, I want it for my class. It is so good. And then, the, and then, you know, the IT department wants to like bend over backwards to like make that happen. They get it, you know, they download all this stuff. They do this. Teacher goes in the classroom, uses it one time, never uses it again. So, so we, we would have this issue. We always have this teacher's convention. People would say like, oh, can I have this? Like some vendor shared something and they were like, want it. I'm like, I need to, I need you to tell me why I need you to go into it. And part of it was that I wanted people to actually understand the viewpoint of how this would affect learning from the viewpoint of a learner, not just like, do you, do you know what I mean? So that's why these questions are meant to be conversational. It's not just like it department. You need to prove how this improves learning. It's like, okay, if I'm going to spend, if I'm going to spend time implementing this, going through all these things, because I do have to change the infrastructure for this to make to be happen. How is this going to actually benefit kids? Like you need to explain that to me as a teacher. And I think that's part of the reason. Um, so the next question that I have in this is if, if we're to do X, what is the balance of risk versus reward? Right? So is there something that comes to your mind when I when I ask that question? Balance of risk versus reward? Oh, should we open up YouTube or not? Yeah. for our students, you know, should, for me, it's, it's opening up, uh, you know, what, what are our filters mm-hmm. going to look like? So certainly there's going to be some risk, Yeah. but what's the reward? Well, we're empowering our learners to be digital citizens. We're giving them the opportunity to, to learn how to live in this world. Uh, and we're giving them a lot of opportunities. The rewards are I mean, unlimited learning potential, really. Um, but yeah, there's certainly risks. Yeah, there's, and I, I, there's, sorry, go ahead, Adam. Sorry. Yeah, there, there's always going to be risks. I, I've hmm. you know, I've came across a few, you know, back when we used to have Google Plus, and that that, that was uh, definitely something that I'm glad is gone now. We used to get some uh, some right. CD. Uh, uh, Google Plus. Yeah, we would come across <laughs> those feeds, and um, but you know, it, there's always going to be some kind of risk, and if we we're trying to make this whole thing. And it's, uh, these kids, uh, their learning experience to be totally antiseptic, then they're they're just not going to succeed in the real world. And and I understand, you know, the fear mm-hmm. of risk, but yep. you know, it just how how we're we're going to mitigate that. That, that that's the that, that that's the conversation. And I think it all just comes down to conversation. You were talking a lot earlier about relationships, and that, that that's right. what you specialize in. And I, I think that that's applicable here too, because if you you have that relationship and conversations between your your uh, your teachers, your coaches, your admin in IT, if that's an ongoing conversation, then all these risks can can be mitigated. Yeah, and I think I think when we look at this too, when you, you brought up the example of YouTube, right? So a lot of school districts and still to this day will block things like YouTube. And the thing is, is that I don't know if you if you maybe I'm dating myself, but there was like that conversation like have your computer in like the kitchen so everyone can see it. And it's like, OK, well, now I could just go take my phone in my bedroom like I can have access to everything. Right. Like how like that advice just kind of goes by the wayside really quick. And so for me, one of the risks when you block these things is actually you're just saying to kids, good luck. You figure it on your own. And what what's happening is that it's not that we're not willing to take the risk. We're just saying sometimes in education, this is not our problem. You will just hope for the best. Right. And so the other thing too, I've talked to and specifically about like YouTube access 
it's like we're always concerned about what kids will watch what they'll see and i understand that and like that's why they have like safety filters and things like this but what a lot of people don't talk about is actually kids making youtube videos kids actually creating content kids actually doing this too right and so i think it's and i think you know i know this from the viewpoint of like right now we're making youtube videos going through this process we're making podcasts that we have access to but you know, not many schools necessarily do this with their students. And I, I'm seeing more and more, and I love it, actually doing podcasts, having kids creating content. So I think I think these are, you know, and I think it is saying like, hey, what, what are some of these risks? What are some of the things? How do we mitigate this? But also, what are we taking away? Because I think a lot of times um, we take away uh, from kids, and this is the last question, is, is this serving the few or the majority, right? And so when I asked that question, it's that that was specifically targeted at the notion of like, let's block YouTube because two kids did something stupid, right? Or like, let's not have social media in school because, you know, four kids might do something dumb. Like, have you have you seen that aspect where it's like, hey, we're going to punish the majority for because a couple of people aren't going to make the, make good decisions? Uh, that actually reminds me of all the stories that you tell in your keynote about those kids uh, tweeting. Yeah, uh, tweeting tweeting negative yeah. Social media. yeah. So, yeah, that, that's kind of funny. Um Kind of what some of the, my experience in that was, you know, there's, you know, I'm very liberal about opening up um, mm -hmm. apps like like Google Chat and Gmail. I mean, we have Gmail all the way down to our kindergartners. We, we want them yeah. to start learning that skill. And again, when I when I train the teachers and students on that, you know, I, I give a warning. I go, listen, if, if you're going to abuse this, remember, you can't delete this stuff. We, we I can go right. in anytime and see what your history is. And and teachers will, will message me, hey, so-and-so has been inappropriate on this. So I'm not going to shut that off for everybody. So I've, um, you know, IT is giving me the the ability to go create sub organizations where I call it the probation or sub uh, sub OU, where they have access to everything. But maybe I'm going to kind of put them on a timeout from from Gmail mm -hmm. and chat. But I'm not going to punish the 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 whole right. the whole herd. Um, and it's, it's definitely it's uh, I got less and less kids now in, in probation now. It's it's good to get, when I finally get them out and they they've learned that valuable lesson that there is a consequences for, for right. their, their digital activity but do you know you know it's really important about what you just did adam and i think this is so because it was open you actually did stuff with kids to say like hey be aware of this whereas if you didn't open it you wouldn't have that conversation and then Correct. they'd use it somewhere else right yep. and i think that's that's the real important aspect of this is that when you block everything you actually don't have conversations with kids. <clears throat> you don't actually talk to them about how to be safe. You know, what are the negatives? Um, you know, kind of doing that because um, it's not a problem. We don't have to deal with it. Someone else will teach them and we're just kind of hoping for the best. And then you see, you know, adults act inappropriately on social media, being nasty to one another. And you're like, how did that happen? <laughs> like, well, cause we blocked everything forever. Right. So like that is probably, you know, partly on kind of, our approach to this stuff but i i love i appreciate that you 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 went through this with me uh it's an old it's an actually an old article that i shared but um i know both of you kind of live this because you're not just focused on i think this happens in some places and i appreciate that it's not like in your it department it works well with you they're focused on um just the tech side of it but the, but as you said earlier the learning side is the is is where we need to begin from right the people side is where we need to begin from the tech comes after counting on other people to make the change they have total control if you know sometimes and i remember actually i love listening to some stuff from will smith and basically he says you know even if you're wronged putting you know by someone else when you constantly blame that person and you blame that thing and you want them to fix it now you actually have given them more power right and really he talks about this and i'm paraphrasing and I, I don't have access to this i just i'm talking off the top of my head but he kind of talked about this is that basically when we we give all the other like we have to find the solutions ourselves too and it's not like and mandy says it's not an either or but i also can't just wait for this to happen and mandy kind of actually addresses this and i and i really like what she shares here she had widespread systemic systemic change, on the other hand, is something you cannot necessarily control. It definitely does happen in a day. Maybe it doesn't happen in a day, maybe not even every day. What you do have is influence over change in the system. You have the ability to be an advocate for change, to ask hard questions, to get people to change their minds and, and to offer solutions. You have the choice to fight the good fight and work towards these massive changes that will ultimately impact everyone in a positive way. Think legacy, friends. Guess what you need to do that? Energy. 
guess how you get it? Self-care, the irony. And I, I really appreciate how Mandy shares that. And I think um, it's really powerful kind of just thinking about that connection and, and, and doing this. And one of the things that I've said before, and some people aren't, you know, to be honest, you're huge fans of when I say this, but I think it's it's important to address is that when when you kind of look at some of the things that that happen in our world, um, understand that when we say the system, like what it, the system is not this thing that just it's run by people. It's always it's always run by people, right? People do these things, right? And I've seen people that um, you know are superintendents complaining about you know the system. I'm like, you're the superintendent, <laughs> like you're the, kind of the boss, right? And just kind of thinking about that, or you know, people in like really high up positions. I'm like, if anyone has the opportunity to change something, it's it's you, right? And sometimes we just kind of pass the buck to over over to other people. And so I think kind of seeing that we are, you know, we can be the solution um, in this, in this as well, um, to do this. So I really appreciate Mandy sharing those things and, and making that connection. I think that's such a powerful concept. 